Thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Vidak, and welcome um, everyone. So the goal of our panel will be to dig deeper uh, and build on the first panel of the day and look into the LLMs, the AI, from the more practical perspective of applications um, in this sector. Um, on the panel, from your right to your left, we have Chris um, from NVIDIA, Judith from Scotia Bank, Garrett from Voya Investment Management, and Peng from JP Morgan. Uh, just as a reminder, you can look up the buyers online for, uh, uh, for any details. One interesting anecdote before we start, you know, we look at the transcripts of these conferences in the past, and I don't know if you know how many times the words large language model, transformer, GPT were mentioned. Zero. So uh, uh, we really need to compensate uh, uh, for that. Uh, now, I wanted to start with uh, Chris uh, from NVIDIA um, to help us put investment management space in context. So uh, let me put it this way. Do you see fund managers queuing up in those long queues to buy the GPUs from you? And uh, yeah, how does it fit with the other sectors? Yeah. Uh, so that's definitely not something that we've seen a ton of so far, uh, you know, and I think that part of that is because there's still a huge amount of uncertainty around how it is that language models are going to be able to be used in the space uh, and everything that people have seen, you know, and we were just talking about issues of, of privacy and legal issues and, and all of that. Um, you know, I think that there's going to have to be a lot more clarity uh, that, that comes in either through, you know, new models that are built specifically around uh, you know, this particular use case or whether it's uh, large players like diving in and, and seeing like real results and real returns coming out of it. Uh, and I think that's going to be the, the tipping point that allows a lot of other smaller players to come in and be like, okay, what's the unique angle that I can take on this? What is, can I use a different model? Can I use different data? So until we see that, I think that everybody's kind of sitting on the sidelines just sort of being like, uh, who's gonna who's gonna take the leap first, and then what is the like really concrete results that are gonna come out of that? Because we haven't seen a huge amount of interest so far. It's mostly been from startups, you know, as, as we discussed, that are looking at new types of models, looking at sort of quantitative models, things like that. Yeah, and out of curiosity, but in contrast, which which sectors are the top of your list in terms of buyers? Uh, healthcare is massive. Healthcare is actually the largest segment, at least in terms of startups. So I, I focus on the startup community inside of NVIDIA. Uh, and healthcare is far and away our biggest area because it can encompass a whole variety of things from, uh, you know, older technologies, I mean, older comparatively, like uh, computer vision and, and medical image analysis uh, and newer technologies like genomics and you know being able to use generative models for protein folding and being able to use generative models uh, built around medical language so that's been a huge area for us robotics is also large but uh, that's more that's more around like simulation uh, but from a, a language models perspective healthcare and then media so everything that we saw around uh, you know mid-journey instability and all that which kind of shook the the it terrified, frankly, the, the media space, uh, or at least the executive level in the media space, uh, have been the, the biggest adopters, I think, and the quickest adopters. So in other words, investment management is not there on the list yet, but for those in the investment management space that are leading the charge, we have uh, three representatives here. So what we wanted to do now is a bit of a deep dive into a couple of use cases. Uh, we'll start with, uh, I think, Peng and Garrett uh, with you, and then Judith, you will kind of elaborate on a special case uh, later. Uh, maybe turning, Peng, to you, um, can you explain a bit or give us a couple of examples um, where at JP Morgan you guys deploy maybe first LLMs and then stretch it to broader kind of AI concepts? Uh, yeah, thank you. So where we are deploying large language models right now, I think is probably very common to like a lot of the other uh, you know competitors and clients in our industry which is you know first of all we use our um, you know large language model train it on let's say JP Morgan proprietary data sets you know so let's say if to our case specifically will be trained on JP Morgan research reports so that we make it kind of finance specific domain specific and then when we kind of benchmark these domain specific models that could be a little bit smaller than let's say GPT-4 uh, on tasks that are specific to finance. Like for example, we feed them news headlines and then we ask the models to identify sentiment. We find that smaller models trained on proprietary data sets 
perform about the same to even slightly better than the more general purpose large language models. You know, so with these kind of models, what we can do is then we can produce, you know, uh, signals, right? Like more generally, um, sentiment analysis or summaries, which can be turned into signals, and then we experiment on whether they produce uh, trading alpha. You know, and so yeah, we've seen some success. You know, so I think that's probably one example where, you know, it's pretty easy to imagine. Okay, where large language models can help, and how you can make your own customized bespoke language models that help you retain your edge and therefore generate alpha. You know, so that's one area where we're investing a lot in. And then another area is, as you said, more broadly, well, you know, if large language models can, you know, be fed words and then, you know, spit out predictions of words, can we also feed it numbers? And then it can spit out prediction of future numbers, like, you know, market returns or volatility. So that's something a little bit more experimental. But you know we've done that uh, as well, and I think that's something a little bit less examined by our clients uh, and our competitors. But you know we've been doing the research on this as well, and we found some pretty interesting success on, on specific uh, use cases. So in other words, sort of a, a signal-oriented, sentiment-based indicators on one hand, and then experimentation with some time series and sort of predictive um, analytics on that. And can you share a little bit more about the practicalities? So for instance, you mentioned you train on your own research data to make specific, uh, uh, to the degree you can share the, is it, do you use open source model? Um, do you build in-house? Can you give us a, some detail? Yeah, so actually our model, uh, you know, obviously we started this research before ChatGPT, you know, so we, we're not using ChatGPT, we use something called MPNet, which is open source model developed by Microsoft, you know, so it's a smaller model, as I said, a little bit older, but given the high quality input data, it performs, uh, it seems to perform just as well as, you know, GPT, so we're pretty happy with it. But of course, you know, there's nothing that stops us from using GPT 3.5 or GPT 4 as well. There's other kind of practical considerations like legal compliance, computational power, uh, but, you know, obviously these things will get sorted out in time. So, you know, we are open to you know, migrating to some of these uh, large language models and ex expectations, of course, with more powerful model and proprietary data, then they should be able to perform even better. So you took that model and then you essentially, technically you fine-tuned it or uh, yeah, exactly. to, with, with your own it. data. Yeah. And uh, to what extent what you're working on is actually in production versus sort of R&D and experimentation? Uh, so we are very close to packaging our uh, sentiment analysis into data sets, data feed for our clients. So I would say that that part, you know, MPNet fine-tuned with JP Morgan data, the uh, signals are, you know, in production or slash close to be in production. The utilization of large language models within our organization is still at a POC stage because, you know, we still have to work out, you know, some of these legal compliance issues. Yeah, I think it's the theme uh, uh, also, Chris, you brought up in terms of that, that early, relatively early stages for the sector and compliance considerations. And briefly, the biggest challenge so far, like, let's put sort of compliance and those things aside, but more operationally, anything that, um, that you're encountering? Operationally, I mean, computational power is the biggest uh, issue because it's not like before where we can just run our own model on our local machine and then expect an answer in five minutes and then we can iterate a thousand times until we find the optimal solution. Right now, we have to go on cloud, use GPU, work with our technology team uh, to run these back tests. So, you know, you have to be, number one, very thoughtful about how much compute you're taking up. Number two, when you design the algorithms, design the models, you also need to be aware, okay, I cannot, uh, I have to optimize these things as well. So it, it does require, you know, a different kind of expertise to train these large range models, to design these large large you know AI models compared to the more classical statistical models. And as you say that, I see uh, NVIDIA Chris is smiling, electricity providers is, are smiling, and um, uh, uh, that flows through. So, so that's a few examples from uh, uh, JP Morgan. Uh, uh, Gareth, could we turn to you? And similar question, give us an example, maybe some context first, what you do, and, and a couple of examples, how you deploy LLMs AI in, in your space. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for the question. And I think Chris will be very happy because my central point will be not that AI is coming, but it's already here. And I'll, I'll, I'll speak to that very precisely. 
But what we do uh, at, at uh, Voya Machine Intelligence is we actually are running a host of equity strategies using AI, dedicated equity strategies. It's more than a billion dollars now. Now that's a drop in the ocean versus the 300 billion plus uh, that the firm manages, but it's growing very quickly. Performance has been very strong. And again, it's direct uh, AI fundamental strategies. That's one thing that we do. The other thing that we do is we are combining that AI with human intelligence in a very structured, hopefully uh, sophisticated way, right? Trying to draw the best out of human and machine, which we can get into. But but the first part we've been doing, that is running AI strategies, competing against human beings for fundamental investing. We've been doing that for more than a decade and more than three years within Voya. But the super cool thing is the second piece. And that revolution has been kicked off by, you know, the LLM story, uh, which is almost, it reminds me of the late 90s, the killer app concept, where it wasn't the app itself, which was the most amazing thing. It was the fact that it revealed this incredible embedded ecosystem of tech that was already in place and ready to go. And that's what that's what the LLM story has done. There are a host of really incredible AI technologies that uh, have been ready to go, pattern recognition, uh, sentiment analysis, all the rest of it. And the LLMs have just brought a focus onto that. So we've seen a major transformation in our firm, uh, a, a major revolution in how they're looking at uh, investment management. And it's in two, the final point I make, it's in two, two domains. The first is obviously, uh, productivity and efficiency in your workflow. So that's the, the boring stuff, but you know, you, you know you get an ROI, that's automating research, all of that. But it's also the top line alpha generation process. And that's the stuff that we're very excited about uh, bringing to the table as, as well. So, so digging a bit deeper uh, on, on those applications. So can you, can you share similarly a bit more like very practical stuff? So open source, commercial, in-house, outside, um, how do you deploy, whether it's just LLM or the, the other technologies? Yeah, so we, we use almost every, if you think about AI as an umbrella term for a bunch of individual uh, technologies, reinforcement learning, Bayesian networks, LLMs, ex et cetera, we use almost the whole panoply because it's very case by case, right? These are tools in a toolbox. You don't want to just have one tool. So to your point, we most definitely already use LLMs uh, uh, to help with uh, reporting, building narratives about particular stocks that are purchased, uh, helping research in terms of very rapidly identifying what might have been the trigger item or news item for a, uh, a fall in the stock price. Maybe you can use that for ESG research. So for research and reporting, already LLMs, uh, in terms of helping to look for predictive patterns in stock data, i.e. fundamental investing on equities and in the fixed income world, we use a Bayesian networks, we use reinforcement learning, we use a host of those technologies in order to do a different thing, right, which is optimize for our performance versus improve productivity and efficiency. And, and similarly, so uh, uh, Peng was talking about the uh, POC level, uh, some experimentation, getting close to launch. Uh, is your stuff in, in deployment now or to what extent it's actually live and feeding it's, the trading? It's live. We have, uh, we have a, a, a live track record for more than three years at the firm. We have more than a billion dollars in assets across different equity strategies, which are 100% run by uh, AI. Uh, as well as, or we're already live in plugging our AI signals into traditional discretionary processes. That is, the fundamental teams at the firm that run their own strategies are now actively using the, the AI signals that, that we produce. And why is that? It's because this is not quant, right? AI doesn't do what quant does. Quant finds a small, uh, small anomalies, uh, uses a whole, you know, whole uses leverage or uh, a very blunt approach to try to to try to uh, leverage those anomalies potentially that don't exist anymore whereas AI does very much the same of what a, what a human being can do looks at a complex sets of set of data looks for very complex idiosyncratic patterns in that data and plays them forward without bias or without career risk or institutional imperative all the rest of it 
So this is not quantum mental. This is, this is a, you know, quant is kind of my background and there's nothing I do now that is like a quant factor model. So uh, like in the first panel, one of the panelists consulted some of the models. I had a quick chat with GPT-4 and with Lama 2, ask for a question for this panel. So one that came in and maybe uh, Garrett still staying with you on uh, for your live deployment, uh, quoting, markets are dynamic, ever-changing beasts. How do LLMs adapt to rapid market changes? That, that was the machine that asked that? Yes. Oh, this is, like, That's, I, I'm sorry, Lama to I, I talk give to. up. I, like, the machine's going to win at that, at that point, honestly. No, I, I'm not I sure. I did prompt for the toughest <laughs> ones. So. Uh, yes. I'm, I'm not sure right now uh, if LLMs are the technology that will solve that particular problem. Chris, you... Oh, I was, I was going to say that I think that um, LLMs right now are a singular tool it's when you know some of the stuff that you noted around this this is not a quantitative thing uh, being able to take in what we term multimodal inputs and outputs uh, into models where we expand beyond just LLMs and look at things like computer vision and and um, you know recommender systems and, and all of that like building that in, in an overall package I think is going to be the point where LLMs as we think about them become effective enough uh, and can source unique enough data uh, that, that this is able to be something that's relevant. I mean, I always think about the, when I first heard about what Bloomberg did, you know, years ago, specifically looking at, uh, they were looking at satellite data around um, the shadows on, uh, on oil tanks, like on oil storage units, uh, and, or in uh, gas storage units, something like that. And essentially like the shadows changing, like changed sort of the, was because it was a reflection like the physical change of, of you know, the storage facility. And it's that type of like bananas unique data uh, that I think can come from multimodal models as opposed to just purely LLMs. One thing I would also add from my side on the, the challenge, so there may be challenges to the predictive powers and so on, but that in no way stops you from, you know, we call it building your army of robo-analysts, your, your digital labor force uh, that you can deploy, right? I know you guys also talk about virtual virtual analysts. That does not require that predictive power to solve that, that problem. Uh, so one of the... One of the biggest issues more fundamentally in this space is this notion of how do those mo do those models have any sense of knowledge right philosophical get a bit philosophical for a second but the answer is sort of no unless you assume that our brains work no differently through random associations too right so but putting putting that aside there is, um, by way of introduction here, looking at Judith, there's this whole new wave of approaches, I guess you can explain that better, with, based on causality and, and causal inference and statistics, um, that's now gaining a lot of traction as potentially a solution to this issue in finance, correlation is not causation. Can you introduce the topic briefly first, and, and then maybe let's dig a bit deeper what you guys do in that? Yeah, sure. Uh, thanks, Robert. So uh, in my space, I'm in market making, uh, real-time trading, intraday uh, risk management space. And we have high dimensional interactive terms in the market. Like you said, the market is uh, dynamic and unpredictable. So we're trying to now narrow down uh, what's causing market makers um, the, the most challenge, which is in the idiosyncratic risk space. We, uh, we can handle system, system, systemic risk by hedging but idiosyncratic risk in the market making space, uh, we can lose a lot of money very quickly without the, the ability to hedge. So how do we manage in that space better? How do we, con uh, how do we predict what's going, what's going to happen in a, in a better form we turn into causality uh, analysis? So most of, most of the time we know where these idiosyncratic risk came from. It's either from um, buy-sell imbalances, temporary buy-sell imbalance, liquidity issues, or from short-term technicalities, dislocations, overbought, oversold, but also from a real-time fundamental uh, news updates. So how do we uh, draw the causal graph um, uh, among those variables and be able to handle idiosyncratic risks so we can do better risk ma management, such as speed up or slow down our trading, um, and, and as, as, as well as um, managing our risk management horizon? Uh, that's, that's where causality comes into play. 
So in our uh, very practical um, area, we didn't go to AI first. We actually stayed with the machine learning uh, techniques, most, uh, mostly in causal discovery space, which is uh, narrowed down the feature, uh, feature selections but using causal discovery um, methodologies to, to excluding, uh, to identify confounders, uh, mediators, or colliders, all those uh, elements in a causal graph. So, so let me yeah. just say, so uh, uh, if, if any of you get puzzled by confounders, mediators, uh, and those classical terms, uh, 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 let me try, let me t you correct me if I'm wrong, but is it fair to say that the whole causality movement is really a bit ab like, um, like in, 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 in healthcare, for instance, right? That there is this uh, notion of um, uh, randomized uh, uh, control trials and, and the best practices and how to be scientific about things. And the argument is that finance haven't, hasn't done that, right? But now with certain new techniques, there is ability to, to approximate that, that equivalent of randomized control trial. Is that a fair? Yeah, absolutely. Like we, uh, the analogy is the A-B test uh, or finding the right control group to actually assess the, the real impact of, uh, of causal effects of some e certain events or, or news updates. Um, so it's exactly that idea finding out the counterfactual uh, moves if, if the, uh, to mimic what if the event or the, uh, the, the triggers didn't happen mm -hmm. to the stock, what would the stock performance would have been and to assess the proper uh, impact. So in addition to uh, feature selections, we also use causal inference, um, more connecting with uh, another big element requirement for stock market, which is time series analysis. So in the causal inference model, we act, we, there's a, the old traditional Bayesian structured uh, time series. We can actually plug in those time series analysis in the causality framework, uh, so such that it can also handle time series um, a prediction as well. So, so is it back to somebody else was talking about, like, we yeah, can predict the next likely word. Can you predict the next likely data point? Is that? Yeah, so, so we were constructing, um, let's say uh, a stock gets a price, uh, target price downgrade on a day. We want to assess what's the impact for that event for, for the re remaining of the day. Let, so if the stock gets a price downgrade in, at 12, 12 noon, so what's the remaining um, return, access return for the stock uh, till, till close? So we can better assess how, how we should manage it. Is it overreaction? Is it underreaction? Mm -hmm. Is it going to extend to the next day? Uh, is it going to have a contagion effect on the whole sector? So all, all of those, we, are, we assess the impact from the counterfactual time series, which, which uh, requires to con uh, come up with a control group, which is just like in the medical field, uh, the, looking at the placebo effect. Uh, uh, so it's, it's all built into the framework. And I guess the other, the other sort of incentive to look at the space is, I think it was 2021, Nobel Prize in economics did go to people doing work in that space, yeah. correct? So um, I think that may be one of those profound moments in finance when finance goes more scientific. So worth uh, watching uh, for it. Uh, I wonder, uh, uh, Garrett Pank, whether you guys, like uh, also it's sort of a matter of uh, semantics and language, but like, do you, do you also do stuff in this space in terms of causal inference and ap applying those techniques? Causal inference, probably a bit less so at the moment, but definitely we use uh, transformer models for forecasting future, you know, uh, returns and volatility of assets. And we find it actually to work really well on some, you know, time series, right? I mean, obviously transformers, it's not the answer to everything, but I think for certain areas, you know, like where does it work the best? If you think about, okay, what's so special about Natural language processing is basically the memory retention, right? Because when I have a conversation with you, if, if I can remember what you said, not just yesterday, but two weeks ago, two months ago, two years ago, then our conversation will be much more meaningful. And that's basically what Transformer is good at doing. It's good at retaining long-term memory. And for kind of, you know, financial time series, I think you can easily come up with things that have long-term memory as well, like volatility being one. I think the memory property is well known. Right. So, you know, even though we are looking at tomorrow's volatility, but, you know, the market remembers what happened back in 2020 COVID, back in 2008, et cetera, et cetera. So we find that using transformers to forecast volatility actually leads to a very significant improvement in forecasting power. So, so you know, that's one thing we've had good, good results in as an example. Interesting. Uh, Garrett, you want to add to? 
Yeah, we we, we approach it the same way, uh, and it's it's and it's a it's it's a very interesting uh, development. That the one piece I'd add is it gives hope for all of us who are human beings because uh, th- there in all of these different worlds, it still looks strongly that there's a role for the best human beings in investment management. Uh, and in fact, it, it, that classic winner takes all uh, type approach is likely to play itself out. Where, it, where meaning, if you're very very good at your job. And the machine is just there to assist you, whether it's a causal inference or whether it's a alpha generating signal or whether it's a productivity tool, you are extremely well placed. And by the way, you don't need to be the AI person. It's probably likely that you are not. In this particular uh, problem set, this is why it's interesting to have uh, you know real experts like Chris in the room. You know, finance is really interesting because it's a competitive beauty contest that we're all in. It's not just a static problem. As hard as a healthcare is, investment management is really difficult challenge uh, to, to deal with. So in all of these worlds, we just see that the machine adding value to the best humans uh, workflows. And so you end up in a world where better results for clients, better performance, but a smaller number of very effective human beings doing a, you know, a, lot, of the, a, lot, of the, a lot of the work. And to the point on workflow, we also find that you know, if you go to the more practical stuff of um, you know, data extraction from unstructured content, right, or yeah. all these components, um, LLMs and those models are just one tiny part, important, but it's one tiny part of the complete workflow. Yeah. Uh, that but I, I can add just one element, just again to that expertise. So domain expertise is key in this. The sexy algorithm piece is going to be commodified quicker than we can all ex- expect. And uh, you know the incredible compute that's available is amazing. But what can't be competed away rapidly is expertise and uh, internal data. To J.P. Morgan's point, so you know anyone with a process that has a, a, an interesting way of looking at the investment universe that can now be codified. In in my jargon, I call that feature engineering. And if you've got some very interesting ways to look at your investment uh, uh, process. We can, that can be codified, and then, and then AI, machine learning, causal AI, all of these tools are just there to help you get a better solution than you'll do al- alone, right? And that's the world we're entering into. And I, I hammer that because anyone that moves quickly on this uh, is, you know, is going to be Netflix. Those that drag their feet, blockbuster is, is the future because this is a dramatic change in, uh, in how the investment management business is run. So uh, get a model open source or otherwise if you have funding internally built and uh, fine tune with your proprietary data and seek an edge that way. Um, uh, guess what you are saying? Um, uh, circling back still on, on some of the details, uh, so, so back to, the, to you, can you, like within the group that you work, same question as before, how much of this is actually in with that causal inference application? Is it in production? Is it R&D? Where, where are you with that? Yeah, so we are piecemeal meal, meal, uh, putting those in researches into production. So we, uh, we actually start in, in the space that we've built the ecosystem so far. We've built in everything that can be automated, as well as uh, the, the research has been built in for decades, such as optimization. So we can hedge all the systemic risk on a real-time basis. So the next piece for us to build into the ecosystem is alpha signal to even handle the systemic risk cannot handle be handled. We found in a long term uh, long term perspective, the correlation between stock and its uh, and its sector is only about 52 percent. So the the remaining is all idiosyncratic and alpha risk. So we're we're in the peace meeting uh, put into uh, the the alpha risk implementation into production by building out a uh, system that human can observe. As, uh, as alluded to by, um, by speakers here, we, st- we are still very much in the machine and human uh, integrated space. So we're building the, the data, data piece that human can observe, and then we put into the automated signals that, that's built on those uh, causality analysis. And just to have a uh, further on uh, to Gary's um, uh, point on how LLM can help in this space, there's a latest, a very recent research that LLM can understand the causality from a metadata perspective, like reading a column name instead of a column, uh, using a column value, which is the, the traditional time series analysis. So the column name like yesterday's, yesterday's return, today's return, and today's news 
in, in the language model, it's very natural way of connecting them, draw the associations, draw the dependencies, so to, to, draw, to help the human come up with a causality graph um, uh, to begin with. So, so LLM more acting as a bridge yeah. uh, between, between the two. Yeah, it definitely goes beyond the, the, the traditional quantum mental space, where this is a quant signal, there's a fundamental analysis. This is really LLM coming up with the fundamental causal graphs and then pipeline into a time series numerical model. And also digging a bit, uh, uh, one last bit on that on, on the technical side. So, uh, Peng talked about open source, fine tuned. Um, uh, uh, how do you, can you share how you, what do you do actually in practice? Absolutely. So, we're actually having both. We use a both open source and, um, and also working with fintech uh, groups, which has people who actually support the models, building the models. What we found is that open source are high quality, high caliber pe uh, folks behind it. However, when you hit a, when you hit a problem, where do you go from there? Um, what my experience is, I had I had cross validation issues. Like everything, everything makes sense. Uh, the the scene makes sense. The practice makes sense. The anecdotal checked out, uh, but the cross validation did not didn't pan out. So where do we go from here? Where when it's open source, you have to. It's it's very difficult uh, to collaborate from that point on. Versus working with a group of people who actually build a model, we can go to the next step and figure out uh, the next move. Back to the human expertise, Garrett. Uh, you were talking about, and, and if I, I didn't ask uh, uh, on this one, like you open source your own model, I mean, you have a mixture, right, uh, in-house? Yeah, that's right, it's a mixture. A mixture of that. Um, uh, okay, so uh, let me now turn a little bit to um, another topic, kind of more forward-looking, uh, covered a lot of like what you guys do today. Um, I'm, I'm kind of uh, looking at Chris here, thinking, you know, today OpenAI has a big conference. There will be lots of announcements apparently there. Um, Chris, when you look at the landscape, maybe just not, not, not just in investment management, what are a few sort of themes, topics that you expect come up in the next year or so based on the startups you work with, uh, technologies you see? What would you point out for people to watch for in that space? I think on the tool side of things, uh, the, the, you know, Gareth, what you mentioned about commoditization is 100% true. Uh, I think that we are going to have as many models, essentially, as we're able to, as, as fast as sort of compute gets out there in, in ever greater quantities. And so you'll have more refined models, but, you know, you know, Peng, you noted that, um, you know, a model trained with better data can be can be better than just a, a larger model. Uh, and so you're going to have a whole bunch of really specific models, dedicated to specific use cases. Uh, I don't think this is like a, a revelatory idea, but uh, right now it's like, this, this splashy, exciting thing, but then it's going to get into the nitty gritty of like, okay, we've got to build a model that is very specific to the reinsurance industry. We've got to build a model that's very specific to uh, just the investment management. We've got to build a model that's very specific to this. And you're going to have, uh, that's when also quantitative pieces, I think, are going to start coming in. We started to see some startups that are building quantitative sort of aware models. Uh, and once those start integrating into the larger models where you're able to take quantitative data as well as traditional like LLM style like outputs, uh, that's when it'll get really exciting. But once again, it's all gonna be about the data. And this is why I, I'm kind of worried, frankly, about the winner takes all piece here uh, because the combination of massive, massive compute that's required as well as very specific and, and oftentimes they want to be proprietary data uh, that could be involved in these things could mean that any large player, right? And I think about Microsoft and the amount of enterprise data that Microsoft has or Google or Apple and the amount of um, uh, sort of consumer level data that they have, they could build a model both with their compute power as well as with their proprietary data that is going to be orders of magnitude more powerful than, than something somebody could build like off of the street just because they're not going to have those years or in some cases decades of insights. Uh, so I think that the large players are going to build a lot of like very specific ones that are tuned to them. And then it's going to be up to frankly the startup community, I think, to build models that have any chance of competing with those by pulling in really unique data sets or university based or government based or something like that. Well, maybe that's the to counter in some to some degree that where you could you could say that for specific you know if JP Morgan sits on proprietary research database doesn't matter what Microsoft do you you, you wouldn't have that ability you can have a smaller model but, but Microsoft can see across every industry right but if you think about like 
depending on how much callback, right, Microsoft mm. does with Office, right, and especially since it all went online, which companies, like, write documents in what ways, most often, when, where, how. Yeah. Like, they have a visibility across industries that is bananas. Big big question to to watch for and uh, uh, with a few minutes left uh, turning to uh, judy garrett pank like um, if you look forward and uh, uh, sort of over the next year in terms of things you might deploy look at um uh, anything particularly on your mind so uh, big hopes on oh this technology this technique may may make a difference yeah, we'll definitely closely follow uh, on the development of our uh, LLM. Uh, Chat GPT, uh, GPT 4.0 already showed a lot more improvement, material improvement versus the previous versions. And Time GPT uh, also just came out, although it's uh, very in a very early stage and nascent stage. You mean Time GPT, right? Time yeah. GPT. That's the first foundational uh, uh, GPT model uh, came out to predict anything in time series space, which is uh, what Ken also pointed out. So we're definitely uh, watching closely and also being hands-on in those space, not just uh, not just as an audience, but also the practitioners. Yeah, well, just just an observation. Uh, when one of the last big moments like this was in in New York City, when uh, Gary Kasparov, the the famous chess grandmaster, was defeated by IBM's Deep Blue. You know that. Uh, that amazing story. That was 97, so it's 25 years plus uh, here in the city where, where that occurred. And the funny thing was, there's many interesting things about that, but uh, one of the interesting things was that immediately after that defeat, it was assumed that machines would beat all humans all the time, everywhere, under all circumstances. But actually, it took almost 20 years until it was the case that machines could beat all humans. In that 20-year period, between when Kasparov lost to Deep Blue and when Deep Mind uh, started to tackle chess, that that 18 year period, the best technology for that problem was was best machine and best human for that 18 year period. So my intuition tells me it's not going to be next year that AI is able to do everything that everyone does in investment management. It's definitely going to it's definitely a revolution. Uh, and a lot of things are going to happen very quickly, but it, but there is a strong role for very good, uh, high capability, high expertise human beings in in this industry. It's at least the hope that I have. Human human hope. As a former chess player, I can actually tell you how fascinating it was to look in 2018 when chess kind of got solved, yeah. but it was by doing billions of simulations playing against itself without any guidance except for the key rules which is quite an interesting thing we are um uh, uh we have one minute left so just spank maybe um one other thought from you on the sort of forward-looking basis yeah i agree like large language models is not the answer to everything i think very soon we'll find very specific use cases for not just large language models but you know the technology that underlies it which are the transformers you know that it's good at you know and i do think that in a few years time you know we'll talk about things like large language models transformers and apply them in the same way as we apply black shows models to option pricing, apply mean variance optimization to portfolio management. You know, so if we talk about specific specific problem, we'll automatically say, okay, well, I'll use transformers to do that. You know, now to get there, it may take a little bit of time, but I'm sure we'll get there, and it will be as prevalent as those tools. Um, you know, in terms of finance application. And I guess to, to wrap it up, I would refer to what Lama 2 told me when I asked for a bit of a geeky joke to close. You know, you know why, why did the large language model break up with the dictionary? Because it found the dictionary too definitive and not creative enough. So on that creativity and human note, uh, let's all enjoy the innovations in this space. Thank you to our panelists. Thank you. Thank you.